Welcome to Treasures from the Rabbi's Library. This is the final in our second series. It's sponsored by Chavi Hertz, a member of our community here in Beverly Hills. It's in memory of her father, Yisrael David Michael, whose yard site is on the 9th of Teves, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to commemorate his memory in this way through Jewish history, through Jewish learning, and we hope his neshama has an aliyah we should be zeicher to see Tuchias Hamesim. Treasures from the Rabbi's Library. So if you're watching carefully in the fourth episode of the second series, which uh, was uh, broadcast three, four weeks ago, whenever it was, and has since been uploaded onto YouTube, you can watch it there, you'll notice that at some point I made reference to a bunch of books that I was going to talk about, but then of course I never spoke about them because we ran out of time, and we try and keep this to about an hour. I can't always promise to be uh, entirely uh, precise about that hour, but I do do my best, and I usually pile in far too much material to contain it in an hour, and either I have to curtail it or, and push it off to next time, or I go over the hour time mark. But I'm going to come back today to the, the books. We have them here. And it's with reference to the Belzer Rebbe. So we spoke last time about Reb Arla Belzer and the fact that he was rescued from the Holocaust. And we spoke about the testimony from the son of the person, the, uh, the Zionist in Budapest, who's... Uh, whose certificate the Belzer Rebbe managed to obtain. He didn't do it, of course, himself. It was given to him, and that Zionist uh, went out on the Kastna train, but didn't make it, unfortunately, died very soon afterwards. But we're going to now talk about the Belzer Rebbe through this series of books that I've got here on my desk. As you know, I am uh, so curious about every topic relating to Jewish history, and generally speaking, if there's a book that comes out about a topic... Uh, particularly modern Jewish history, I will buy it. I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of, you know, you know that whenever a new book comes out, all the major university libraries and national libraries of the world have to buy it. They now include my name on the list. I'm not a national library, but I do try and obtain every book relating to Jewish history that I can get my hands on, and I read it. I don't just have it sitting on my shelf. Before we get to the books, let me show you another photo. Um, today is going to be a bit of a photo day. So I showed you a photo uh, last time, a picture of the Belzer Rebbe in Beirut when he met with Rav Herzog. We're going to come to, hopefully, we're going to come to Rav Herzog a little bit later on, uh, and we're not going to have to push it off to next time. But when uh, the Belzer Rebbe arrived in Eretz Yisrael, he didn't have the clothing that one would normally expect a Rebbe to wear. Now, of course, he was from Poland, Galicia, and he wore a particular set of clothing. And until that clothing could be put together, there he was having to use the clothing that was provided to him by the Hungarian uh, Jews or the, those Jews of Hungarian origin who lived in Yerushalayim. And they provided him with what's known as a beaverhit, which is a hat that's um, very low with a wide brim. And here is a photograph of him. You can see his beard still hasn't fully grown. And he put on this um, Yerushalmi Hasidic hat. And that's the hat he wore until they managed to make him the, uh, the Strymel and the hat that he was used to wearing from his origins in, in Poland. So that's a photograph. It's very, very rare. Um, and uh, I think that we're going to post it properly on the YouTube but uh, in the meantime, here you can see it. So now let's look at some of the books that I've put together from the Bells collection. Here we have a book which is called Pikdushase Shel Aaron. It's not just one volume, I think it's a couple of volumes. And this is Toldois, Hanhogois, Uvdois, Sipure Kodesh, the Imrois Tahoirois from Reb Arla Belzer. So it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. All the things, how he led his life, particularly, I have to say, after his rescue, but also including stories from before the Second World War. It's a fascinating couple of volumes to tell you about this angel, this Malach Hashem that was Rabbi Arla Belzer. He was an extraordinary man, and he was not just extraordinary because he was saved from the Nazis. He was extraordinary 
before, he was extraordinary afterwards. He was just one of those people who was a spiritual mentor for many, even if they weren't Bells of Hasidim. And that's the first book I wanted to show you. The second book I want to show you is um, Sefer Zikoran Likilas Hibnev. And the reason I want to show you that book is because we have another book here, which is the uh, Dvar Chain and Per Moshe, from somebody called... Um, it, so this is the incredible um, story of the Ortner family. And Ortner, um, Reb Dobberish Ortner, um, was one of those who saved the Belzer Rebbe, who continuously lobbied anybody who was willing to listen, who was, who was living under allied, um, I, I don't know how to ex express it exactly, but in, in countries that were the, a part of the Allies against the Nazis, in any way that he could, he was lobbying for the Belzer Rebbe's rescue. He came from Hibnev. This, by the way, is his autobiography, Dvar Chaim. It's a, it's a remarkable book. If you can get your hands on it, you should. Um, and Zichronos Marav Kodesh of Bells. And then we have here a much more general book, which is the book about Hibnev, which was the place in Galicia where he came from. Uh, here is the book, if you want to see it. And uh, if you can get hold of it, I think it's quite rare. I don't think it's so easy to get hold of. Maybe it's available as a download or PDF but it's a fabulous book about the Jewish community of Hibnov in Galicia, where the Ortner family came from. Then we have here, this is multiple volumes. Beisai no Ava Kodesh. This is the official biography of the Belzer Hasidim of Rabbi Arla Belzer. Uh, and it's many volumes. I only bought one volume here to show you because otherwise it would be piled up very high. Um, and this is a fabulous book. Likute Zichronos for Anhogos. And it's, uh, it really has uh, incredible information and it reproduces documents. Let me just show you one. Um, there's many. Um, I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, in every volume we have quite a number of, of different documents that are displayed. But uh, here's one just, just to show you by way of example. You can see there a document that's reproduced. Uh, it really is a remarkable book talking about all the different aspects of the Belzer Rebbe. You know that Bells was one of the most important um, Hasidic groups in Poland and Galicia and Hungary during the period between the First and Second World War. Of course, it started off during the 19th century under the Sar Sholem of Bells, and it continued to grow and thrive. They established something called Machzike Hadas. Uh, this today, a Machsik Adas in Yerushalayim. But uh, the Machsik Adas in Poland was an independent Hasidic organization which um, federated anybody who had to do with bells who wanted to come under their umbrella. And they had Shechita, they had Botedin, they had Yeshivas, they had um, schools, they had everything that you could imagine. And bells was a thriving Hasidus. Unfortunately, it was decimated by the Second World War, but Rabbi Arla Belza escaped. And as a result of the survival of his brother, who then had a child, uh, the nephew of Dov Berish, Rebero Belza, who became the Belza Rebbe in the late 1960s, a son-in-law of the Vizhnitzer Rebbe, Belz is today, again, one of the great Hasidic groups, one of the great Hasidic sects of the Jewish world. Finally, we have a book here, which is called Rescuing the Rebbe of Belz, and it's published by Art Scroll. Here you have it. Um, and it describes in, um, in some detail the rescue of the Rebbe of Bells. In fact, it's a very important book. I, mean, I don't want to in any way diminish its importance. But it was, of course, um, sponsored by a particular element of the rescue organization uh, by the Landau family. And uh, um, the Landau family, Landau was the... Um, was in charge of the ghetto in Bochnia. He was the Jew who coordinated uh, everything that happened in Bochnia ghetto with the Nazis, and therefore he was a rather controversial figure after the Second World War. wasn't um, universally loved because people felt that he had compromised the Jewish values of saving lives in order to save those that he felt needed to be saved more than some others, and, you know, people had paid money to him 
in order to get rescued and hadn't been rescued, etc. I'm not going to go into the details, but um, I wouldn't say Iker Chosem Ren HaSefer, but there are some elements of the story, obviously, which have been glossed over in an effort to paint Landau as the great saviour of the Belzerebbe, and it's excluded some elements of the story, or some of those who weren't rescued and perhaps could have been rescued by Landau, but of course we cannot judge we weren't in those shoes, we weren't in that situation. A fabulous book. If you're able to obtain it, I'm not sure if it's in print, it Rescuing the Rebbe of Bells, published by Art Scroll. We'll move on now to something else. Um, I wrote um, in the past few days, or I actually wrote it quite some time ago, it was published by Tablet Magazine in the past few days, The Battle um, in the court of Sadiger. It's an article about the recent shenanigans, about who should be the Rebbe of Sadiger after the passing of Rabbi Shol Moshe Friedman, the Sadiger Rebbe, who took over from his father, Rabbi Avram Yaakov, who was the third person with the name of Avram Yaakov, who was the Sadiger Rebbe. And he died in 2013. Unfortunately, Rabbi Shol Moshe, a couple of years ago, um, uh, was diagnosed with cancer. He died in August, and there has been some uh, dispute as to who should take over. He has a son, Reb Shiela, 24-year-old, who is the Rebbe in Sadigar in Bnei Barak. But there are another couple of children who are also titled Rebbe. One of them is Reb Modcha Sholem Yosef, Meshi, who is the Rebbe of Sadigar in Yerushalayim. And another one is Reb Arend of Ber, who is the Rebbe of Sadigar in my home community of Golders Green in London. Now, people mentioned to me that there were elements of the article um, which lacked the detail that they would have uh, liked to have heard. It's absolutely true. In this case, I can say, Iker Choset Menha Sefer. There are parts of the story which I simply either cannot tell or do not want to tell, and I won't. However, somebody did mention to me that I missed out some important elements of the backstory of Sadiger, even though I did bring up some of the elements of the story which people didn't know uh, previously particularly the story of Yisrael Aaron, the son of Rabat HaSholem Yosef, um, the original Rabat HaSholem Yosef, who was the Rebbe of Sadiger who survived the Holocaust. He had a, an older son called, uh, who, called Yisrael Aaron, who lived actually here in Los Angeles at the end of his life, who went through some great difficulties. And um, I discussed that in the article. You should read the article in order to uh, gain greater familiarity with the incredible ups and downs, the roller coaster history of the Sadiger dynasty. But in the meantime, somebody did point out that there was a brother of Abraham Yaakov II, who I failed to mention, and he suspected that the reason I failed to mention him is because he was very sympathetic to the Zionist cause. Not at all. Let me tell you, he was included in the original draft of the article, but we didn't want the article to become a Megillah. So we had to reduce it in size, and therefore there were certain parts of the article which were excluded. The original article was 10,000 words, the final article was 5,000 words. So you, just, you can draw your own conclusions as to how much we had to leave out in order to convey the story in a palatable way, in a way that could be read easily by the readers of the tablet magazine. But, now that you mention it, let me show you a fabulous photograph which I've had for many, many years. This photograph is of the Mizrahi delegation. All the rabbis and activists from the Mizrahi delegation at the 1921 12th Zionist Congress in Karlsbad. Now, it's, this photograph is absolutely fascinating because pe people don't know, don't realize that there were some very senior and very important um, Orthodox rabbis who were deeply embedded and involved in the Zionist movement in the early 1920s, particularly because in the wake of the Balfour Declaration, people felt that opposition to Zionism was not only pointless, but was counterintuitive in terms of their Jewish faith. And we have here, if you look very carefully where my finger is, and when we put the video out on YouTube, you'll see this uh, blown up. This is Reb Shlomenu Friedman. He's uh, seated alongside his relative, the Drobitcher Rebbe, Rav Shapira. 
This is Rav Shloman Yufridman, who was the brother of the Sadiger Rebbe, Rabbi Rav Yaakov, the Avir Yaakov of Sadiger, an uncle of Rav Modcha Sholem Yosef of Sadiger, and a great uncle of, of Rav Shloman Moshe Friedman, who just died. So he was not only um, a, a scion of Sadiger, he was also somebody who believed deeply in the Zionist cause, and in fact, I believe that his children and grandchildren are certainly more Dati Lu'umi than they are Haredi. And I don't know much more about them. Perhaps somebody, one of my Baker Street irregulars, can tell me a little bit more about the descendants of Reb Shlomen Yufridman, who could have been the Sadi Rebbe. He decided he didn't want to be, but he was certainly highly respected and very highly regarded in both the rabbinic world and in the Sadiger world, and here he is seated at the 12th Zionist Congress as part of the Mizrahi delegation. Just to tell you that um, over here, where my finger is, you can see somebody called uh, Rav Moshe Shmuel Glasner. I've mentioned him previously in one of my treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Rav Moshe Shmuel Glasner was also known as the Doira V.E. He was the Rav of Kloisenburg, and he was a great-grandson of the Chassam Sofer, an extraordinary man, um, and um, here I have the details, by the way, you can look it up on Jenny, of Reb Shlomo Chaim Friedman, Reb Shlomo New Friedman, who is the Sadi Gereba. Here is the photograph that I have, which is one of the finest photographs available, of Reb Shmo Moshe Shmuel Glasner. Reb Moshe Shmuel Glasner, um, his son Reb Akiva became the Rav of Kloisenburg, and he was no longer Mizrahi, he was Aguda, and there was a son here in Los Angeles. There's great-grandchildren um, who live on the East Coast, and I'm in touch with them, and of course uh, they are descendants of the Chassam Sofer, no different than all the other descendants of the Chassam Sofer. Rav Moshe Shmuel Glasner left Klosenburg in 1922, and he moved to Eretz Yisrael. He was a close friend of Rav Cook. He died in 1924. I have an unpublished letter that he wrote when he departed from Klosenburg, from Kluge, in which he highly criticized Rabbi Yoelish. Um, at that time, he wasn't the Satmar Rebbe, but he later became the Rebbe of Satmar because Rabbi Yoelish had established a, an alternative so-called Yureim community in Kluge, in Klosenburg, and Rav Moshe Shmuel Glasner was not just deeply offended, but felt Rabbi Eilish had completely got the wrong end of the stick. Here's a picture of Moshe Shmuel Glasner. So now you, ha you no one should think that in any way I'm trying to obscure history, and that I'm trying to paint a particular um, stripe or line, and toe a particular line when it comes to the history of Orthodox Jews. Absolutely, there were great rabbis, and there were great rebbes, who were deeply involved and deeply embedded in the Zionist movement and who believed strongly in the creation of Medinat Yisrael. Now, let me go on to the next thing, which is that uh, last week, in the last week, Menachem Butler, uh, a friend of mine, you've heard his name before, uh, posted a video of Rabbi Daniel Sperber. Let's see if we have a picture here of Rabbi Daniel Sperber. We do. Rabbi Daniel Sperber, um, who is a rabbi in Israel, and he was taking the chison, he was taking the vaccination in Israel. Thankfully, most people are going to be able to get the vaccine in Israel um, far earlier than we are going to be able to get it here in the United States, because what a fantastic country Israel is. But Daniel Sperber, Rabbi Daniel Sperber, Rabbi Dr. Daniel Sperber, did something quite unusual when he had the vaccination given to him. He said the bracha of Shehecheyonu. Are you allowed to say Brach of Shecheyonu? Well, he considers himself to be a Poiseik. And therefore he said, obviously, you can and should say the Brach of Shecheyonu, Vikiyamonu, Vigiyonu, Lazman Hazer, with the shame Umalchus, when you get the vaccination against COVID-19. Now, I'm not going to make a Psakalocha. I will say only this, that I will not be saying Shecheyonu when I get the vaccination. However, I want to tell you a little bit about Rabbi Dr. Daniel Sperber. Who is he? And what makes him feel that he has the right to be a, such a strong poisic to come up with such controversial decisions? Well, I have here a picture of his parents. His father was a man called Rabbi Dr. Shmuel Sperber. And he moved to London in the 1930s. 
where he lived um, principally in Cricklewood. He moved during the Second World War to Wales, where he was the rabbi in a castle that had been obtained by Rabbi Dr. Schoenfeld. And he was, in fact, Daniel Sperber was born in Wales, believe it or not. Did you know there's a country called Wales? I hope you did. Wales is part of, of the United Kingdom. And he was born in a castle in Wales where his father was a mentor and rabbi for refugees escaping the Nazi Holocaust. And here he is, Rabbi Dr. Schmuel Sperber, a very great scholar, a prolific publisher of books and very, very interesting material. He moved to Eretz Yisrael in the 1970s. He died during the 1980s. But who was Rabbi Dr. Shmuel Sperber? And here we come to something very, very interesting. Because here we have a photograph that I'm going to show you. It's a very unique photograph. It's a meeting of the Ma'etzes G'doyle HaToyra in Yerushalayim in the 1950s. And, uh, and the, I don't know if this meeting was about Chinuch Atzmai or it was a general meeting about um, matters pertaining to the Haredi community in Eretz Yisrael, but there's some very interesting people here. For example, here you have, the, um, I hope my finger's pointing in the right place, this you have the Tshubina Rav, Rav Weidenfeld, Rav Weidenfeld, and you have here, next to him, um, over here, you can just about see his face. This is somebody called Rabbi Yosef Naftoli Stern. Standing and speaking is Rabbi Meir Karelitz, who is a brother of the Chazan Ish. Over here, you have Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank. He was the Rav of Yerushalayim, and he, of course, was somebody who had been involved in Rabbonus and Dionus in Yerushalayim from a very early, from the from the um, early 1900s, I think in 1920, became the Rosh Bezdin in Yerushalayim, is the Rav of Yerushalayim. We have here, um, this person here is Rabbi Yisrael Yitzchak Reisman, who died in 1965. And um, we have Rabbi Velvel Minsberg is also on the picture. Um, here, standing here as a young man, is Rabbi Menachem Porush, who for many, many years was one of the principal um, representatives of Agudas Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael, and of course he was a member of Knesset and, uh, and in deeply involved in the politics of the State of Israel on behalf of, of Haredi Jews. But the point is that in between the Tribuna Rav and the Tzvi Pesach Frank is this man here. Can you see him? And hopefully we'll be able to blow him up um, and you're able to see him in greater detail when you are watching the video on YouTube, that's a man called Rab David Sperber. Yes, Rab David Sperber. He was the father of Rabbi Dr. Shmuel Sperber and the grandfather of Rabbi Dr. Daniel Sperber. Who was he? He was the Brush of Arov. The Brush of Arov, Rabbi David Sperber, was one of the greatest poskim of Romania in the generation before the Holocaust. He was born in 1877. His father was a chosid of Reb Chaim of Kosov, that's a Hagar, one of the Vizhnitz family, the Torah Chaim in the late 1920s and the early 1930s. Do you know what the Brasher of Arov was doing? He was the main representative of the Satmar Kehillah, the Satmar community, against Reb Yoelish Teitelbaum, the Satmar Rebbe, in his fight to become the rabbi of Satmar. Obviously, they lost that fight because the Satmar Rebbe moved from Krula to Satmar in 1934, but he had been appointed in 1928, and the Brasher Barov was the Toyin, was part of the Zabla that was appointed to try and get rid of Rabbi Yolish as the rabbi of Satmar. Anyway, he somehow survived the Holocaust because in Romania, many of the Jews there managed to escape the worst um, aspects of the Holocaust, they weren't murdered. And he came to Eretz Yisrael in 1950, where he lived in the Shikun Harabanim, which is, a, that's worth researching. If you ever want to research something interesting, research the Shikun Harabanim. It was a building in Yerushalayim that was built specifically for rabbis who escaped from Europe. And it was a place where all, some of the greatest rabbis of pre-war Europe lived in the post um, 1948, State of Israel. He was a member of the Me'etzes G'doyle HaTorah of the Agudas Yisrael. Of course, that's what he's doing in the picture, which I showed. And he died at the age of 85 in 1962. He was one of the great rabbis of pre-war Europe, who I wouldn't say disappeared without trace um, in post-war 
Eretz Yisrael, but certainly was no longer considered as important or as influential. He came from a Vizhnitz Hasidic family, and he had this son, Rabbi Dr. Shmuel Sperber, who, um, who was born in 1906. He died in 1984. Um, he was a great scholar and a writer who moved to Eretz Yisrael, as I said earlier, in the 1970s. And this Rabbi Dr. Daniel Sperber, who's a prolific writer, um, he's officially, of course, an Orthodox rabbi, but very controversial, as we can see. But that's the origins, something to think about when you, you know, people see a, a random video and they wonder who this is, what this is about, and how can I put this into context? Well, there you have some context. Uh, and let's move on to the next thing. Um, last time in the episode, I spoke about Reb Shimon Posen who was originally from Frankfurt, a Rav um, who was the son of the Frankfurter Dayan, and he eventually became the Rav in Schopren, and he was a Munkacher Chosid. I showed you some pictures of him in older age. Here's a photograph of him as a young man. So, um, in case you were wondering, I had looked for this last time round, I had managed to find it, but here's a picture of Rav Shimon Posen at around the time that he became the Rav in Schopren in Hungary. I want to just, and you know, people have been emailing me and saying you obviously have a fantastic collection of photographs, and, and therefore, would you be able to share some of those photographs with us in Treasures from the Rabbi's Library? And I, 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 I am uh, acceding to this request, and I want to begin with um, Rebleza Silva. And hopefully in future... I will be able to share with you some wonderful photographs that I have in my collection. I'm going to hopefully have time to look at an album that I've put here on my desk um, in relation to the uh, photographs of Benzi and Eisenstadt. But um, let's just begin, if I may, with Reblazer Silva. If you can see that behind me, I'm going to stand up, I have behind me a photograph. It's a most wonderful photo. I have it in, on display at my house. And this photo is of Rebleza Silva. It's four poses. I actually have another one. And I want to say this. If somebody emails me, the first person who emails me who would like the fifth photograph of this collection, I will send it to you with my compliments. So just email me and say that you would like the fifth photo from this collection of photographs of Rebleza Silva. It's a wonderful photo of Rebleza Silva in profile. Rebleza Silva was the Rav of Cincinnati. He was the president of the Agudas Sarabonim, and he was the founder, one of the founders of Agudas Yisrael here in the United States of America. He was also associated, I mean, he was very creative in his um, associations. He was also associated with Mizrahi, and he managed to become one of the senior rabbis of the Frum Jewish community in America. He came here in the early 1900s, and he was a character. He was an incredible uh, Talmud Chochem, and he was Chabrusa and um, learning partner of many of the great rabbis during his early years. He died in 1968, and he was also extremely active in saving Jewish lives to the extent that it was possible in the pre-Holocaust years, during the Holocaust, and of course immediately after the Second World War. So this is the photograph that is hanging on my wall at my home here in Beverly Hills, but I'm going to show you some more photographs. Thank you, Carly. So here we have the first photograph I'm going to show you um, is actually a remarkable photograph. It's the original photograph. You can see it's in very poor condition. It's the original photograph of the 1925 Hachtara of Rebleza Silver in Springfield. And some of the great rabbis of America and beyond attended. Well, let's see if we can see some of those people here. This is Ramaz Magolius. This is Rabbi Yisrael Rosenberg. This is Rabbi Bernard Revel, a Talmud of the Chofetz Chaim who founded Yeshiva University. This is Rabbi Leventhal from Philadelphia. This is Rabbi Sheftel Kramer, who was the, at that time a Rosh Hashiva in Cleveland, Ohio, together here with Rabbi Levenberg, 
who was his boss, who was a Rav of Cleveland. This is Rav Friedemann, who lived in New England. He wrote a number of Sforim. You can't see him here because his face has unfortunately disappeared, but this is the Maitre to Ilui. But most importantly, and this is one of my favorite photographs of all, this is none other than the Torah Tamima, the Bala Torah Tamima, or Baruch Halevi Epstein, who looks more like the banker that he was than the great rabbi that people imagine him to be. He's wearing a bowler hat and he has a very closely cropped beard. A wonderful photograph here. And here, of course, is Rebleza Silva himself standing at the center. He was the um, person who was uh, crowned that day as the rabbi of Springfield. Later on, he became the chief rabbi of Cincinnati, or as he styled himself, the chief rabbi of the United States and Canada. Here's a photograph, it's a most wonderful photograph, of Rebleza Silva and the Dvar Avram, Rabbi Avram Dovber Shapira, um, who was the um, who's the Rav in, in Kovna, and this is the detail on this photograph is it's an original photograph, and the detail is so clear that you can actually see the individual hairs on the beards of Rabbi Kahana Shapira and Rab Laser Silva. A fantastic photograph. We'll we'll have it uh, blown up and properly displayed when we put this up on YouTube. We have here a photograph. I love this photograph. I actually saw it um, some time ago. Uh, if you look at the Kavarim.com um, entry on Rav Hutner, you will see um, this photograph, and there's a number of people here who the person who put the photo up on there cannot identify. It's a photograph of Rav Leza Silva speaking to a chosn at a wedding. Rav, Rav Hutner is at the far end, and they can't identify anybody else. Well, I know all the identities of the people there. One of them is Rav Nachman Tzvi Eisenstadt. The other one is Rabbi uh, Nubisler. He was from Philadelphia. And the one at the front with a very strange-looking face is Rav Tuvia Stern, who is best known as um, the um, Rav HaMachshir of Hebrew National, uh, the it's the kosher meat that many people who eat kosher don't eat. Uh, um, Rav Tuvia Stern, who later on lived in Miami, a great Talmud Chochem, but he's also on this photograph. So if you are on Kavarim.com, you may want to update the, this photograph because uh, whoever uploaded this photo couldn't identify any of the people on the photo. And then we have this wonderful photo. Uh, it's a photo of Rebleza Silva after the Second World War. He went to... Um, Europe, and he dressed himself up in army uniform. He recognized that he would get more respect from the army if if he would dress up in an army uniform. And here he is seen um, sitting down and being addressed by the Rav of Baranovich. The Rav uh, of Baranovich was Rav David Weitzel. He'd survived the Holocaust. And here he is addressing um, Rav Leza Silva, who's dressed in army uniform. Again, we'll have this properly displayed on YouTube. And finally, I love this photograph. This is a photograph of Rebleza Silva after the Second World War meeting with a person called, um, uh, I believe his name was Thomas Mazarik. Thomas Mazarik was the Czechoslovakian foreign minister. And even though he wasn't a communist, he worked with the communists um, until such time as they felt he was no longer useful, and then they threw him out of his bathroom window. And he, um, officially, they said he committed suicide. This was in 1948. But here you can see Rebleza Silva. I believe that this photo was taken in 1946. And a couple of years later, Thomas Masaryk was dead. His father was Jan Masaryk. Uh, I can't remember if we, this one is Jan and his father was Thomas, or he was Thomas and his father was Jan. Either way, this was from a very distinguished... Um, uh, uh, Czechoslovakian political family and here we see that Blaise Silva is meeting with this politician. I love actually photos of rabbis with distinguished politicians which brings me on to my next photo. Here we have a marvellous photo. The photo is of Rav Alkali. He was a Yugoslavian rabbi and he eventually ended up, because of all the problems in Europe, he managed to find his way to the United States, where he became one of the leading Sephardic rabbis in New York. Here in 1964 is a wonderful photo of him together 
with Bobby Kennedy and Jacob Javits. This was after Bobby Kennedy was elected senator. Uh, Jacob Javits, of course, was the senator. Did you know that Jacob Javits, do you know why he's got the name Javits? J-A-V-I-T-S. Javits, Yavits. He is a direct descendant of Rabbi Yaakov Emden. I don't know if he was against Rabbi Ernest Nebuchadnezzar, but he was the senator for New York. And here he's pictured with a rabbi. So it's a wonderful photograph. I have another photograph here of a rabbi together with a famous politician. Um, and this one is um, Rav Herzog. I told you hopefully we'd get to him. This is a photograph of Rav Herzog. And he's together with Herbert Romulus O'Connor, who was the 51st governor of Maryland. And what I like about this photo, by the way, these are press photographs. I, I often buy old job lots of press photographs when uh, newspapers and uh, press outfits get rid of their archives. They don't have anyone to buy their photographs. No one's particularly interested in them. And I buy them, particularly if they have photographs of rabbis. And then I try and get rid of the photographs that have no rabbis on them, but I keep the ones with the rabbis. Here's a picture of Rav Herzog and Herbert O'Connor. And what's interesting is, in those days, they would enhance photographs before they were published in the media. And you can see here, I don't know if you can see the detail, um, on the on the zoom but you may be able to see it on the YouTube that they actually they painted over parts of the photograph to bring out certain details so that they would be able to um, enhance the photo when it was eventually published but I know that the, what I'm about to show you has got nothing whatsoever to do with rabbis and politicians but if I'm already talking about Rav Herzog I have a wonderful photo here of Rav Herzog together with the Ger Rebbe and you can see there that Rabbi Ichamai Levin is speaking. I have no idea what the occasion was, but uh, Rav Herzog, who of course was the son-in-law of Rav Hillman, and I published the Sefer of Rav Hillman earlier this year. Rav Herzog was the chief rabbi of Palestine, the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, a very great Talmud Chochem and a great man. And here we have a photograph of him together with the Ger Rebbe at this event. I'm sure that the Ger Hasidim who are watching this will find this um, extremely interesting. Okay, let's move on to the to the photo album. Um, people ask me about the Babinci uh, and Eisenstadt, the photographs that I showed last time from Babinci and Eisenstadt's uh, um, photographic reference book of rabbis in the United States. And I'm going to, I have here actually, I, I bought a Bensi and Eisenstadt collection. Um, here we have a picture of Reb Simcha Bunim Seifer. So uh, the Shevet Seifer, an incredible, an incredible photograph. These are called cabinet photographs that they were, they were um, stuck onto card and people kept them on a mantelpiece. They didn't have to actually frame them. They did frame them. But um, they were they were sold as collector's items. Here we have an original, believe it or not, original photograph of the Malbim, and it's after he died, and it's the late nineteenth century. But it's a cabinet photograph of the Malbim. I get to put that back. Um, this is very very interesting. So if you recall, in one of my very first treasures, I spoke about somebody called the Marcheshes. So here we have a photograph of his father, Reb Simcha Reuven Edelman. So you're going to wonder why his name was Edelman. His name wasn't um, why his name wasn't Agus. But Reb, uh, Reb Simcha Reuven Edelman was known as the Sar Ben Chayil Hadulami. He was a Lithuanian rabbi. He was a scholar of the Hebrew language, an incredible scholar. He was a publicist. He was a prolific author. And he was born in Vilna to Reb Chaim Yehuda Leib Edelman. His, um, his mother was called Sarah Guta, and she was the daughter of someone called Reb Shlema Zalman Agus. And as was very often the case in those days, they took the name of the father-in-law and they made that into the family name. may have had something to do with getting out of the army or whatever it was. Um, in any event, he studied by Reb Itzler in Velozhin, and he lived in Kovna, he lived in Brisk, he lived in Tells. He was married twice. And one of his children was Reb Chanoich Hanach um, Agus, 
who we discussed, who was the author of the Marcheshes, one of the great pre-war Lithuanian rabbis. He was the de facto rabbi of the Jewish community in Vilna after the death of Reb Chaim Oiza, but he worked very closely closely with Reb Chaim Oiza, um, one of the great rabbis. So this was his father. Um, you can look him up, but this is an original photograph that was sent to Reb Benzian Eisenstadt um, when he was putting together his book of photographic uh, uh, biographies of rabbis all over the world. Well, this one is fascinating. Another fascinating photograph. I could keep on showing you photographs all day. don't know how much time I have. You have to forgive me if I go over time. But uh, here we go. This photograph is of Rabbram Yitzhak Glick. He was born in 1826. He died in 1909. He was the he was born in Vertus in Hungary, and he was the Rav in Tolshva for 50 years, and he died in 1909. He published a sefer called Be'er Yitzchak on Chulin and on Gittin in two parts. And he also had Shailas Hachubas, they're called Yad Yitzchak, and Rabbi Yosef HaKoyen Schwarz published a complete volume, which is called Tsofnas Paneach, um, and consists of notes to the third part of this uh, series of Svarim. He also published a book called Parshas Mordechai, um, and it's from Rebordecha Burnett, and it had his annotations on it. And many of his works, unfortunately, were lost in the Holocaust. He was a prolific writer, but unfortunately, many of the things that he wrote uh, didn't survive the Holocaust. That's an original photograph of him. I don't know how many of these there are, but... Uh, uh, maybe you've never seen one. Maybe you know something about him. If you do, let me know. I'm always interested to hear more information. We have here an original photograph, um, contemporary photograph of the Natsiv of Volozhin, uh, of course, who I've spoken about and written about on many occasions. Um, that's the Natsiv of Volozhin. This one is fascinating. So this one is a man. So we have here, I'm going to show you the photo. There is a photo that's very well known of him, and this is it. Uh, his name was Robinson. This is the photo that's very well known of Rav Robinson. And he was a fascinating individual. He published many, many svarim. His name was Rameya Robinson. And he eventually moved to Eretz Yisrael when he died. The Levi of Issa Melta spoke, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Harlap. He was one of the great Lithuanian rabbis. Of course, he's completely forgotten. No one looks at his svarib. However, we have here the photograph that he sent to Benzian Eisenstadt. And what's interesting about this photograph is that he insisted on holding on his lap um, a book on which was written all the names of his svarim so that people would know who he was, even if they didn't know his name, they would be able to obtain his svarim. Svarim, it was the signature of any rabbi. If a rabbi wrote a sefer, somehow that conveyed that he was a great scholar. I, I could go on and on, and perhaps next time we will look more at some of the svarim um, that were uh, published and some of the photographs that I have. But I'm now going to go to my final item, and this relates to something which I requested last time from you, as those of you who are my Baker Street Irregulars, who help me so often uh, gain information, because it's not always possible for me to uh, gain all the information on my own. I need help from you, and uh, we'll come back to this next time. Let's have a look at this. This is, this is an incredible um, piece that I'd like to show you. And I'd like to begin, if I may, by talking about um, Rav Shimon Schwab. Rav Shimon Schwab was the Rav, here's a photograph of him together with my grandfather. Rav Shimon Schwab was the Rav of, um, of Broyers, of the community in Washington Heights that was a continuation of the community in Frankfurt. He was born in 1908. He was a rabbi and communal leader in Germany. And he, of course, lived in the United States. He was part of the Metis de la Torah of the Aguda. Um, initially, when he came to the United States, he was in Baltimore. And then only later on, he was in Washington Heights. He grew up in Frankfurt am Main. Um, his family were long-standing members of the Israelitische Religions Gesellschaft. 
ERG as it's known. That was the uh, name of the community, the independent Orthodox Jewish community founded by, by Rab Shamshan Rafael Hirsch, who was born in 1808, who died in 1888. And he was, uh, was uh, that community was subsequently under the leadership of Rabbi Salomon Breuer, who was born in 1850. He died in 1926, and he was Rav Hirsch's son-in-law. Rav Schwab completed the Real Shula which was the school which combined religious studies and general subjects, um, which conformed with the Torah and Derech Eretz method of Orthodox Judaism that was um, heavily proposed by Rav Shamshon of Hirsch as the correct Derech for Orthodox Jews. Um, and he was a full-time student shortly after that, when he when he graduated high school, he was a full-time student at the Torah Lehrenstalt, which was the local yeshiva in Frankfurt, but by the way, which my grandfather, my mother's father, also studied at. At around the same time, he was, um, he was a student there for a number of years. But then, in 1926, he was 18 years old, he went to Tells in Lithuania, and he studied there for three years. That was highly unusual for a German Orthodox Jew to go to a Lithuanian yeshiva, and afterwards he went for a couple of years to the Mir. Now, in 1930, he spent a weekend, which he would speak about very often in later life. He, he, he um, spent a weekend in Raden at the Chovetz Chaim. It's, and it's, the truth is, it's an absolutely remarkable story. I'm not going to tell it to you here, but he would speak about it. It, was, it left such a strong impression to him, on him. Um, and he eventually got married, and he became a Rav in Darmstadt, and then later in Ichenhausen in Bavaria. Now, when he was in Ichenhausen, he was persecuted by the Nazis, and he realized that it wasn't possible for a Jew to remain in Germany. By the way, many German Jews were uh, prescient enough to realize not that the Holocaust would happen, but that life as an Orthodox Jew in Europe was going to become very difficult if Hitler was going to gain more power. And through Rabbi Leo Jung in New York, he managed to obtain a visa and he became a Rav in Baltimore. Uh, and later on, of course, he became a Rav. He was the assistant rabbi at Breuer's Shul. Um, uh, Rabbi Salomon Breuer's son, Rav Breuer, was the Rav in Breuer Shul. He became old. He looked for assistant rabbi. Rabbi Schwab became the rabbi. In 1979, Rav Breuer died, and um, Rav, uh, Rabbi Schwab remained the rabbi there until he died in 1995. Now, he originally was very much in favor of a very powerful, strong, almost exclusive yeshiva education. As the Rav of Breuer's, he kind of moved away from that path and became much more yekish, much more involved in what the yekas were proposing, which was to be the, um, a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, who could also benefit very much from secular education. Okay, we're going to take a pause for a moment from Rav uh, Schwab, Rav Shimon Schwab, and we're going to look at somebody called Rabbi Avraham Weinfeld. I have here a book called Uri Yushenim. It's a marvelous book. It's a pamphlet. Rav Weinfeld was born in 1929, Kislev 1929, in Kashau. Remember, I mentioned Kashau in the last episode of. Um, Treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Rabbi Avram Weinfeld survived the Holocaust. Most of his family were murdered. He eventually ended up, his rob was Rabbi Neuschloss, who had a yeshiva in Woodmere, of all places, in, um, on, on Long Island. And Rav um, Weinfeld was a Talmud of Rabbi Neuschloss, and he was a very independent-minded thinker. He moved to Monsi, at that time, it wasn't the great and thriving and prolific Jewish community that it has become in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, it was still somewhat of a midbar, a bit of a wilderness. But he sat there and learned all day, had Talmidim. His wife worked. And he was a prolific writer and publisher. And he published Shilas and Shuvas. And he also wrote others for him, principally pamphlets. Now, what's interesting about him is, 
I have here a, a very interesting article by Yitzhak Krauss. Anybody who knows anything about the study of Haredi Judaism will know the name Yitzhak Krauss. Yitzhak Krauss looks at the theology and philosophy of Haredi Jews. Um, he himself is Dati Umi. I believe he teaches either at Hebrew University or at Barilan University. Very interesting. This is an article, Medinat Yisrael, Atchalta de Geula, or Maase Satan. He looks at the differing approaches within the Haredi world toward the creation of the State of Israel. And the first person he looks at is none other than Rabbi Avram Weinfeld. I have here a couple of photographs. I'd like to thank all those who responded to my request last time for photographs of Rabbi Avram Weinfeld and Rabbi Moltres Tzvi Sasna, and we're going to get to him in a moment. But uh, here we have a photograph of Rav Weinfeld speaking at an event. Um, here we have a photograph of Rav Weinfeld. He was a chassid. I mean, he came from a family that were chassidim of Rav Chaskel Shinova. Chaskel Shinova was, of course, the son of the Sanzer, of Rav Chaim Sanzer, uh, Halberstam. And this family in Kashau were very, very strong Hasidim of Shinova, of the Halberstam family. And he remained a Chosid. He has children who are incredible uh, mashpiim um, in the Jewish world. He has a son in Borough Park, I believe. I didn't manage to speak to him. But a remarkable person, Ravron Weinfeld. Unfortunately, he died at a young age, at the age of 57, in 1987. Um, but he left behind a great legacy of writings. What's interesting about him is, as an independent thinker is that he's extremely honest about, for example, the creation of the State of Israel. He says it, uh, it's impossible to ignore the creation of the State of Israel. You can't pretend it didn't happen. You can't pretend that this doesn't have theological repercussions. You can't say that just because the people who created the State of Israel don't fit in with your particular way of thinking as a Jew, that the creation of the State of Israel has no significance religiously. Therefore, he, I wouldn't say he was broad-minded, although there's a certain broad-mindedness in that, um, in terms of if you are a Haredi Jew, but certainly he was open to thinking things through, not from um, a, a prescriptive situation. He wasn't simply trying to analyze it on the basis of something he'd heard in the base Medrash or that somebody else had said. And therefore, and his writings are analyzed here in this article by Yitzhak Krauss. It's available as a PDF online. I'm sure that you can find it. Medinat Yisrael at de Geula o Satan. This pamphlet, which I just showed you a moment ago, is interesting, this Uru Yoshenim, because it proposes that um, the Jewish world, if it is honest and true to itself, should not insist on any kind of religious cooperation with the state of Israel, but there should be a complete separation of church and state in the state of Israel. Uh, by the way, I'm not suggesting that I propose it or that I'm against it. I'm simply telling you that that was a very original line of thought that was put together by Rabbi Avram Weinfeld. That's Rabbi Avram Weinfeld. We're going to come to him in a moment as well. So we've, we've got Rabbi Shimon Schwab, Rabbi Avram Weinfeld, the person who brings them together, as it were, is a man called Rabbi Mordechai Sosna. He was born in 1933. Um, he was born in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in New York. And he learnt in RJJ, in Rabbeinu Yaakov Yosef Yeshiva, um, which, as you know, was a, uh, a very strong institution at that, at that stage. Now it's, of course, in Edison, New Jersey, um, it still exists, but at that stage, in the Lower East Side of New York, it was one of the most powerful educators of from Jewish kids. Anyway, he was an Illui, very devoted to his learning. His father and mother were very from people. And therefore, and I'm very grateful, by the way, to members of the Sasna family with whom I was in contact. Here's a picture of Ramad Chatzvi Sasna, which was sent to me by a member of the family, for which I'm very grateful. Um, he was an incredible person, and therefore uh, the, um, he had a Rebbe called Rabbi Avram Kalman Goldberg, who introduced him to Rabbi Aaron Kotler. Now, he went to the Faher of Rabbi Aaron Kotler, and he was so tongue-tied, because Rabbi Aaron Kotler was so intimidating to him, that when it came to it, 
Um, he couldn't say a word. But Bavrom Kalman Goldberg told a story to Rabbi Aaron Kotler about his father's titkus, that Rabbi Yoyna Sosna, when he was in a, uh, one stage, he went completely bankrupt during the Depression, the Great Depression, and he was sitting in a base medrash learning. Somebody came in with filthy clothes, looked like a homeless guy, and the guy said, I need new clothes. So Rabbi Yonah Sosna said, no problem, I'll go home, I'll get you some clothes. He said, no, no, I need them right now, it's just too much for me. I've got fleas in my clothes, I, 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 need, to, I need new clothes. And Rabbi Yonah Sosna went into another room, he took his coat with him, he took off his clothes, put his coat over his body with no clothes on, and gave his own clothes to this um, man who needed clothes. When Rabbi Aaron Kotler heard this story, he said, I want the son of this Yonah Sosna to come to my yeshiva. And that's how Rabbi Yonah um, Rabbi Motzchatfi Sosna got into, he didn't pass the Faher, but he passed the Faher. He got into BMG, into Lakewood Yeshiva, one of the early Bochrim there. He, um, later on, in 1959, he got married and he became um, a, an Avreich in the Koedl of BMG. And as such, he was asked by Rabbi Aaron to start something, Vad Haromas Lekeren Yeshivas, uh, if I remember correctly, I think that's the name, I've got it here. Um, he started off this institution, Vad Haromas Keren HaYeshivas, in which he would promote yeshiva learning to uh, people of yeshiva age, post, uh, post high school yeshiva age in America. At that time, there was a great fear that Orthodox Judaism was in decline. And some major media outlets and others were predicting the demise of Orthodox Judaism in America and that it would be completely overtaken by conservative Judaism. The Vad Laharamas Karen Hayeshivas was something which was a brainchild of Rabbi Aaron Kotler, but the person who got behind it and who remained behind it for decades was none other than Rabbi Chatfi Sasna. Anyway, Rabbi Aaron Kotler asked him, could you produce a pamphlet? in which you would um, promote the importance of studying in yeshiva over, over going to university and trying to create a hybrid. And he did, but he didn't write it himself. Do you know what he did? He asked Rabbi Ron Weinfeld to write a pamphlet. Now, here what I have, you can see this book. It's a very interesting collection. What it is, is a bound... There's a bunch of pamphlets, let's say 10 pamphlets, and you haven't counted them. Rabbi Shimon Schwab, whenever he received a, a pamphlet, he eventually would put the pamphlets together and bind them in a binder, send them to a binder, and he would bind them in a binder. He's got them all here. All the different pamphlets he's got here. They're all fascinating topics. There's only one in here which he scribbled all over, and that is the pamphlet Boyu Cheshboin. Boyu Cheshboin was the first pamphlet published by Reb Molchad Fi Sasna in his campaign to convince Bochrim and Jungerleit and Avrechim not to go to college and not to seek a secular college education. And he asked Reb Avram Weinfeld to publish it. Anyway, as you can imagine, Reb Shimon Schwab is reading this. He, of course, went to the Hirschschule in Frankfurt he learned secular education. He's reading through this, and he went completely crazy. Look here. I'm going to show you here. At the end, he writes in great detail why he's so angry with what Rabbi Weinfeld wrote. One of the things he wrote was, how dare you publish a sefer, a book of this magnitude and this level of importance where you are encouraging people to discard secular education and it doesn't have a haskoma. It doesn't have any rabbinic um, uh, approval in letters that are published at the beginning. Something which is so significant. You're not just writing a book about the parasha. You're not just writing a book in which you are giving your views about something which is innocuous. You are giving your views about something which is which can deeply affect the lives of those who read it. They may think that this is Das Torah, and there's no Das Torah here. Where is the where is the approval of the great rabbis of the United States of America? Why is it not in this book? In addition, he added in his notes, he says that you have suggested that those rabbis 
who do have a secular education are somehow lacking in Yiras Shomayim. You are suggesting that those schools which teach secular education are unacceptable. So what are you saying? That we should never daven in a shul where the rabbi had a secular education? Are you suggesting that if there's a school that teaches secular education that we are not allowed to go and teach there? You're taking away people's parnosa. You are denigrating and degrading people. You're making them out to be bad in a situation that's absolutely untenable based on the current situation here in the United States. That's totally unacceptable. He must have written him a very, very strong letter. And Rav Shimon Schwab, and this is the original letter that I have received, this was a letter that was written, it was folded into the booklet that Rav Shimon Schwab had bound in this binding. It's a letter from Reb Motcha Tzvi Sasna, in which he explains that Reb Moshe Feinstein was shown this pamphlet but decided not to give his approval, even though he said, according to Reb Motcha Tzvi Sasna, that the contents were approvable, he didn't give his approval. And Reb Aaron Kotler also said it wasn't possible for him to give his written approval. Now, I don't know why Reb Moshe Feinstein and Reb Aaron Kotler didn't give their approval. And I don't know what the effect of this particular pamphlet was. This letter is somewhat apologetic, although it doesn't deny the fact that that which is contained in the pamphlet was published by the publisher. He says Rabbi Ron Weinfeld is a highly respected individual and therefore um, he felt it was right that it was to publish the letter, sorry, the pamphlet in and of itself. And this is what he puts in the letter to Rabbi Shimon Schwab. What we do know is that um, Rabbi Maltrati Sassner published a book a little bit later on, Where Do You Stand? A pamphlet which was a very famous pamphlet, which many yeshivas had. I don't have it, actually, and I took this um, image of, um, of an image online, um, in which he discusses whether or not it's a good idea to have a secular education, but it's not this pamphlet by Rab Weinfeld. And then, of course, you have a very famous um, pamphlet, which was published by Rab Shimon Schwab, Elu Elu, um, which is called These and Those, in which he promotes the idea of secular education, obviously according to Torah standards, but he certainly completely dismisses the idea that there should never be any secular education for those who consider themselves to be yeshiva educated. And with that, we're going to end it today. And thank you so much. And I do hope that if you have any questions, you'll email me. And my email address is rabbi, R-A-B-B-I, at rabbidunner.com, R-A-B-B-I, D-U-N-N-E-R dot com. I look forward to seeing you for my next series of uh, Treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Um, I'm now going to take a bit of a break because I'm imminently going to be publishing my next book. It's called Hearts and Minds. It should be out in January 2021. And for details of that, you'll have to contact my office. But in the meantime, I wish you well. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again.